Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the third lecture of this lecture series. So today's topic is the relationship uh, between economics and politics based on traditional Chinese uh, philosophy. Uh, well, the, the study of uh, politics involves uh, the analysis of the way in which individuals and groups define and interpret political issues uh, and how they seek to, to, to shape the government decisions. So this subject touches a broad spectrum of uh, activities. Okay. Now, in theory, economics uh, could be non-political. I mean, ideally, right? Economists should ignore any political bias to give neutral information and recommendation on how to uh, improve economic performance of a country. Uh, in contrast, however, there is a strong relationship between economics and politics, uh, because the performance of the economy of the economy is one of the key political uh, battleground. So many economic issues are are seen through the uh, the eyes of political uh, beliefs. Now, for example, some people are instinctively more suspicious of government intervention. Therefore, they would prefer economic policies uh, which seek to reduce uh, government in interference in the economy. But meanwhile, um, the economists may, may have a, a preference for promoting greater equality in society, and they, they will, they'd be more willing to, to encourage government intervention to pursue that uh, goal. So, in fact, we will discuss uh, Confucian scholars' opinion about government intervention and lazy fare policy in much uh, detail in a later chapter. Well, Confucians uh, recognize the uh, interconnectedness uh, between politics and economics. So, on the one hand, economic management is the basis of politics, but on the other hand, politics promotes economic life. So in this lecture, we'll study uh, the interaction between politics and economics, uh, how they support each other, okay, from the perspective of traditional Chinese culture. And then we'll, we'll examine some of the fundamental principles of government in order to understand um, uh, Confucius' governing philosophy and methodology. Okay, so let's first look at um, economics as the basis of uh, uh, politics. Now, in fact, I should say that the sages rulers in ancient times, they, they actually put great emphasis on economic management. For example, in the, in the book of history or the canon of history, uh, the chapter of the system of Shun. Shun was the, uh, one of the uh, emperors um, uh, before Confucius' time. Okay, so that chapter provides a lot of details of government, well, governance structure, and key official appointment uh, during the regime of the sages of ruler Shun. So the whole government was divided into nine departments. Okay, as you can see. So let's have a look. Now, the first one is the Department of Water and Earth which is the, um, the interior department assigned to, to Yu. And some of you may remember, Yu later became uh, uh, the emperor. Yu was not uh, Shun's son. Okay. He's a, di a different person. Now, the second is the Department of Agriculture. Then the Department of Education, uh, a Justice Department, and then la uh, Labor Department. The Department of Natural Resource is uh, in charge of forests, uh, animals, and, and mines, and natural resources. Okay, so also there is a Department of Religion, uh, Department of Music, and finally Department of uh, Communication, uh, which which acts as the mediator between the emperor uh, and and the people. Now, among these nine departments, just how many of them are related to economic management then? Well, there are in fact four, namely Department of Water and Earth, Department of Agriculture, Labor, 
and Department of Natural Resources. So we can say that even four thousand years ago, the government was in charge was in in large part、uh, a tool for economic development, and the government existed chiefly for economic reasons. Now let's talk about governance through economic and human resource management. In the uh, uh, the Analex, there is a chapter which shows very clearly、uh, the main channels of governance of a state. The the main channels. The channels involve economic management and human resource management.、Um, so when when Confucius.、Uh, uh, When when Confucius, you know, one of his top students,、uh, Yan Yuan, uh, uh, also known as Yan Hui, okay, consulted Confucius about the governance of the state. Confucius replied as follows: very interesting reply. Let's have a look. So Confucius said, "Well, we should adopt the calendar of the Xiang Dynasty, right in the state carriage of Shang Dynasty." Where the crown of the Zhou Dynasty imitate the music of Shao and Wu, banish the tunes of Cheng, and keep far from specious talkers. The tunes of Cheng are licentious; specious talkers are dangerous. Well, now you might wonder.、Uh, this sounds like a bit of a stretch. <clears throat> I mean, what, what, why do calendars, wagons, hats, or something like that have anything to do with economics? Well, in fact, in this short paragraph, Confucius mentioned two sides of economics: the production side and the consumption side. Now, first of all,、um, there are two things, okay, on the production side. The first one is the calendar. What does that mean? Well, during the Xia Dynasty, people already learn to use the position of the stars to to help them set up、uh, the months of the year. Now, in particular, people are able to trace the movement of the the, the Big Dipper, right, which is the largest.、Uh, well, it's not the largest, but which is a very large uh, aristocracy uh, consisting of、uh, seven bright stars, right, of the constellation Great Bear. Now, people <clears throat> set the first months of the year when the handle of the Great Dipper directly points to thirty degrees north of east.、Uh, also, there is a large volume of historical record、uh, that shows that people of the Xia Dynasty used the position of the constellation in agricultural planning. The system was, in fact, very effective in increasing agricultural productivity. So Confucius wasn't just speaking about the the calendar itself, but he was referring to whatever the method there was in increasing agricultural production, which is the root of economic life. <clears throat> so that was the first item. The second item Confucius re- recommended in dealing with economic management is、uh, to use uh, uh, the carriage of Shang Dynasty. Now here. Confucius suggested to use the technology of the Shang Dynasty. Now, let me explain that.、Uh, during the Shang Dynasty, the te-、uh, the technique of using uh, uh, bronze uh, was、uh, most advanced, and the production of good、uh, of good vehicles require high quality metal parts. So, given the overall technological level of the ancient. The design of、uh, of carriages in Shang Dynasty was not primitive at all, but very complex and, and mature. People in the Shang Dynasty not only enjoyed advanced transportation technology, but also a, a fairly high level of manufacturing capability, which was supported by advanced metallurgy. So all of this leads to better living standard and high logistic and transportation capability. So Confucius spoke about the carriage of the Shang, Shang Dynasty in order to emphasize the importance of employing the best transportation technology to,、uh, you know, to promote commercial activity and、uh, living standard. 
So that is on the production side. Now, on the consumption side, Confucius mentioned that uh, the choice of music should be the one belonging to, to Shun's and King Wu's period. Those two periods. So what does music have anything to do with uh, economics? Well, generally, music represents cultural development. And cultural development represents people's intellectual level. So the standard of cultural consumption uh, has, has a, you know, a, a, a fairly great impact on people's intellectual cultivation. I mean, if we think about music itself, we know that you know, nice melodies and tunes make you feel comfortable. Uh, sometimes it, it, it can stimulate good spirits, right? But you wouldn't like it if tunes are out of place and it makes you feel uncomfortable. Sometimes it could even produce a, a worrying spirits, which can be harmful. Now, the cultural development follows a similar guideline. Now, it should be guided in a way that it, it, it harnesses the bright side of people, uh, with, with, uh, which has a direct impact on people's living standard. Uh, you may know that Confucius had very high attainment uh, in music uh, and his philosophy, the music philosophy. Uh, he could see through the surface and understood the psychological impact of music on people's mind and, uh, and the greater consequence on the society. Therefore, Confucius used the music of the Zheng uh, uh, as, a, as a negative example uh, of bad consumption because the music of Zheng stimulates the spirit of wild excessiveness and lacking of control. If not on a different occasion, in addition to Zheng's music, Confucius' uh, student Zi Xia, he commented that the music of Song makes people depressed, the music of Wei makes people anxious, and the music of Qi makes people arrogant. Well, please do not uh, misinterpret this as, you know, all oh, the, the ancient people worried too much uh, and there was no freedom in personal choice. But first of all, it's not true. And also, it's not that simple. As it is true that the music industry is under very little regulation these days, but, but there are always a baseline consumption standard in, in many other industries. For example, there is an age restriction right, on uh, entering into a casino. Uh, there is also age restriction on the consumption of movies uh, and the use of certain uh, prescribed drugs. And it is very obvious why these rules are set. So you can imagine what it can do to the people's, well, to the mind of a 10-year-old if, if he is allowed to uh, gamble in a casino. Another example, in the UK, uh, the UK government imposes age limit on purchasing alcohol in, in, a, in a supermarket. So I think apart from the obvious physical reason, it's more about the development of the mind of the youth and, and consequential social impact. Now, there are also other you know, many other consumptions that are controlled by the, the, the code of best conduct and morality rather than written law. For example, do you think it is okay for a teenager to wear a £200,000 worth of Rolex Daytona? Well, nobody's breaking any law, but what's the long-term impact on the child's perception of, let's say, modesty and a sense of thankfulness? What happens if the child can no longer consume at such a high level and becomes depressed? So, you know, there are, there are real-life examples around us, uh, uh, tons of it. So if we think about this, um, Confucius' teaching about the careful choice of music is not strange at all. And, uh, but we'll study more details about the principle of consumption uh, in Lecture 6. Now, let's turn our attention to the human resource side of the governance. So we notice that Confucius mentions uh, the crown of Zhou dynasty, right? The crown of Zhou. Now, at first, it looks like something, it looks like this is something related to uh, consumption or production and, and, and not human resource, right? 
However, uh, Zhou Dynasty's official uniform was uh, designed to to remind the emperor about an important principle of governance, and that is to govern the state without any inappropriate man-made dictates. For example, the ruler is supposed to employ the right official for the right job, and and let、uh, let let them fully utilize their ability. So, an interesting fact about the design of the crown is that it has a small、uh, curtain in the front、uh, in order to block the、uh, the emperor's vision, and also it has two earplugs right on the two side of the crown,、uh, and and the function for that. Uh, is to 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 block his ears. So, what does that mean? Well, this means that the emperor should maintain complete neutrality and unbiasedness in the face of gossips, and only use the right person for the right job. That's what it's for. Now, in order to make it clear why this is important to maintain unbiasedness when governing. Confucius specifically points out that the emperor should stay away from people who are full of、uh, chicanery. These people are dangerous、uh, because they make a terrible idea sound legitimate. Remember the demagogue、uh, Xiao Zheng Mao.、Uh, he was one of these people, and the ruler should be careful of the existence of these people and stay away from them. Now you may ask, so what does good human quality entail, and what does it take to be a good official that benefit the people? We'll discuss this in more detail、uh, <clears throat> in part three of the lecture. So stay tuned. Now back to our discussion of the、uh, the politics economics relation. We know that economic management occupied、uh, almost half of the government objectives during the Shun's、uh, regime, right? As you saw earlier in the government、uh, objective list. Now, also in the above quote, we can see that Confucius gave considerable weight to the economic management in the government's to-do list,、uh, because you know, because Yan Yuan asked about that to Confucius, right? Now. Let's formally explain the the rationale of this relationship, okay? And we do that by examining a very interesting conversation between Mencius and、uh, and and the Duke Duke Wen of Tang. So, when the Duke consulted uh, 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 Mencius about the proper way of governing a state, Mencius said, "The business of the people." May not be remissly attended to. So he means that you know the、uh, the government should focus on the business of the people. So what is the business life of people? Well, that refers to the economic life. Now you see, the duke was asking about politics, but Mencius talked about the economic life of people. In order to support his point, Mencius went on and say,、uh, well, and, and illustr- illustrate、uh, the, nat- the natural law of、uh, human life. He said, "When people have certainty in their livelihood, their mind is calm, because they know that there is something they can fall back onto、uh, when when things do not go well." Now, in Mencius' word. This takes the form of ownership of land and real estate、uh, properties, but in modern terms, this is equivalent to social welfare, pension, healthcare, you know, or any kind of、uh, a social safety net in general. But when people don't have such certainty, all kinds of problems arise. Manager said, when there is no security in their nourishment, stability of the mind becomes a luxury. And morality can give way to crime. In fact,、uh, there's a tons of research, tons of research,、uh, showing that countries with a good social safety,、uh, social security system, experience lower crime rate, lower divorce rate, and fewer child abuse. 
So it should be very clear now that the people's welfare is what drives the direction of governmental work. So economic management acts as the basis of politics. And that's why Menchus put the business of the world, uh, business of the people, uh, 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 as the chief business of the state. In other words, if a ruler can attend the, uh, the people's economic life earnestly, he will govern the state well. So, in the next video, we'll be looking at um, how politics can promote economic development.